All right, guys, this is going to be our kind of catch up lecture on chapter 25, covering everything that's uh, not in, that we haven't covered already, that's not in the MLK Malcolm X assignment you did yesterday, and that's not in the Vietnam assignment you're doing tomorrow. So, so the gist of old left versus new left is that the old left uh, were the, uh, the, the new dealers. They're people like Lyndon Johnson, Harry Hopkins, Harry Truman, people like that. Uh, these are uh, people who are more focused on poverty and African-American civil rights. Uh, sometimes that's, you know, depends. And who looked at the government as the kind of best solution for these problems. In contrast, the new left are younger folk. They're college students or college age mostly. Um, and they are much more uh, leftist. They're more open to things like socialism and communism and anarchy um, or anarcho-socialism. Um, they are also, um, they're more focused on uh, anti-authority. They look at authority, particularly government authority, as a big part of the problem, if not the main problem. So that's another major difference between the old left and the new left. Um, and the new left is more focused on this lack of power or this power difference. Um, you know, one of their big focuses or foci uh, is the, this feeling of powerlessness um, in an oppressive world. In that sense, I think, you know, there's some similarity there between them and um, the lost generation after World War I, right? Uh, the difference being the lost generation is very depressed, and feels like there's no solution a lot of the time, uh, whereas the new left want to fight the power and find solutions. Uh, the new left is also overwhelmingly white, though we will see that that's not always the case. All right, so the um, speaking of overwhelmingly white new left, uh, the group that came to be kind of the, the main you know group famous for the new left is the uh, Students for a Democratic Society, otherwise known as um, SDS. Um, and so, yeah, SDS is just, uh, like I said, they are a college student, new left group focused on fighting um, government power, focused on um, achieving civil rights, uh, and specifically civil liberties like freedom of speech, uh, um, freedom, you know, separation of church and state, right? Um, freedom of protest, things like that. Um, part of that, uh, the, the next item on the study guide about them is the Port Huron Statement, which I don't have a picture for. Um, the Port Huron Statement was just the founding document of SDS, um, which I'm trying to see if I wrote much about it. Just complained about various institutions such as employ, you know, corporations, unions, government, and called for a more participatory democracy. So participatory democracy, meaning a democracy that isn't led by politicians, that's led by voters, led by people. All right. Uh, and then I think the next item on the study guide from there uh, was the Berkeley Free Speech Movement, which involved SDS and others. Berkeley Free Speech Movement was a 1964 um, protest movement at University of California, Berkeley. Um, this is a response to a guy named Mario Savio. Uh, a student there who was arrested for refusing to leave when he was giving a speech on campus protesting. I don't even remember really what he was protesting, but um, he was, uh, the Berkeley Free Speech Movement was really notable that you had conservative student groups and liberal student groups working together, banding together, mass protesting together for free speech on college campuses. And they were successful. University of uh, California, Berkeley, uh, dropped the charges against Mario Savio and um, allowed uh, more free speech on campus or stopped restricting free speech on campus. So pretty awesome. All right. Now, the next um, several items on the study guide have to do with uh, the um, Vietnam War, and you're going to be learning all about that tomorrow. So we're going to be skipping through all that. And the next item we're going to be looking at is, uh, is relating to that, but is not part of that slideshow, 
and that is the counterculture. Um, so the counterculture is, uh, I'm just going to read while I wrote my notes, new left move for participatory, participatory democracy to including all sorts of other freedoms as well. These different streams of rebellion combine to form what the media termed the counterculture. It included both college students and non-college students, young people, but young people in general. Um, these are the hippies. Um, they were... Um, uh, they further alienated the new left from the old left because the old left included a lot of like union people and union people just overwhelmingly were opposed to um, the counterculture and all that. A uh, big part of the counterculture was flamboyant displays of rebellion against dress code, language, um, like as in profane, you know, cursing, uh, sexual behavior, drug use, um, one of the most famous members of the counterculture was uh, this guy here in white, Timothy Leary, who was a chemist who promoted the use of the hallucinogenic drug LSD. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so there, uh, there was a lot of, uh, pers uh, you know, the, the, uh, one of the terms the counterculture really focused on was personal liberation. The idea about there was, you know, um, rejecting societal standards and, you know, creatively experimenting and um, rejecting wealth and privilege and or rejecting the pursuit of wealth, right, and the pursuit of power and just kind of being yourself, you know, just being you. Um, interestingly, the uh, counterculture also, um, uh, it also interacted with faith and uh, with uh, faith. Um, Oh, I was going to mention Woodstock was the big music concert that was kind of seen as like the big um, gathering of the countercultures. But anyway, um, there was also an interaction uh, between faith and counterculture. Um, so we see a outpouring of religious fervor um, that is more um, liberal, more more leftist. Um, uh, religious fervor uh, among Christians, among Christians. Uh, we saw this with, uh, in a few different places, um, and I'm going to discuss those. Uh, we have, um, first of all, the Pope at the time held a big conference in the Vatican and then issued a papal decree called the Vatican II, or the Second Vatican Council of 1962 to 1965, but we just call it Vatican II. Um, and Vatican II, um, um, issue in, um, instituted a number of uh, left-oriented um, changes to the Catholic Church, such as um, performing mass, uh, Catholic mass, in the local language rather than in Latin to make things more participatory, right? Um, and a, a new focus among priests and nuns uh, and Catholics in general to pursue social justice issues. And so this is a left movement for the Catholic Church. Um, we also see uh, within the Catholic Church something known as liberation ideology, which spread through the Catholic Church um, and, and called, again, just called for more um, social justice reforms. Um, many young Christians uh, began to see uh, commitment to social change and social justice as a fundamental part of their religion. So this is very similar to the social gospel movement we saw at the beginning of the 20th century that we discussed back in chapter 18. Um, we also saw kind of emerging with the counterculture and faith with the uh, with some of you know religious hippies. And we get a group called the Jesus People pictured here, um, who their their detractors called them the Jesus freaks. Um, but they basically saw the hippie lifestyle as authentic to the Christian church. They created communes and held rock concerts um, and kind of rejected societal norms and standards and traditional fundamentalist Christianity. Um, and along with uh, Christian, you know, with Christians, there was also a new interest in, uh, oops, I hit the wrong thing. 
Uh, there's also a renewed interest or a new interest in um, Eastern religion and Eastern religious practices. This is when we see yoga first come to the United States is in the 1960s. Yoga, which, you know, originates uh, and is still a part of the Hindu religion, uh, is also used in some Buddhist denominations. Uh, but it came to America first as a religious thing, but then as just a, a workout fad. And so that's where we see, you know, yoga first become. But we also see, you know, numerous Westerners like the Beatles, for instance, and numerous Hollywood actors and other musicians and, uh, and American musicians get swept up in Eastern religion in various ways, um, especially, you know, Hindu uh, and with all the, you know, philosophies around that. Uh, it says, I, I'm just going to read what I wrote. There are also a number of cults created during this time. Famous cult leaders, Charles Manson, left. Jim Jones, right. A picture below. Manson ordered his followers, the Manson family, to commit nine murders, including the famous actress Sharon Tate, along with several other crimes. Uh, one of the top members of his cult, um, a woman named Squeaky Frome, uh, later attempted to assassinate President Ford in the 1970s. Um, uh, Manson, for his part, uh, died in 20, I think 2020? 2017, at the age of 83. Um, anyway, and then the guy on the right... Um, as I mentioned, uh, Jones created a commune in Guyana, and after ordering the murder of a U.S. representative who came to investigate them, ordered the mass murder-suicide of 918 members of the cult, including 304 children. Uh, this is where, if you ever heard the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid, that is a morbid uh, reference to Jonestown, but it's also factually incorrect because they didn't take Kool-Aid, they took Flavor-Aid, laced with cyanide. He then shot and killed himself, just to be sure. In fact, I don't know if, maybe he didn't drink the cyanide, the flavor aid. I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's really a uh, crazy, messed up story. And there is a interesting conspiracy theory that his cult was actually part of a CIA program known, known as MKUltra, which is, uh, is interesting. I hadn't talked about MKUltra yet. And I'll talk about it in person rather than in this video because it's not on the study guide or anything. But anyway, all right, let's, let's move along. Um... So the next item on the study guide, we're now moving into what we were going to have just an entire activity about uh, what we call the widening civil rights movement, talking about um, civil rights, not just for African-Americans, but for other groups as well. First with women and kind of the, uh, the, the spiritual founder, we'll say, not literal founder, but spiritual founder and spiritual uh, founding document of the women's rights movement in the 1960s is Betty Friedan and her doc, her book, The Feminine Mystique. So Betty Friedan was um, an author uh, and, you know, social justice activist, uh, feminist, right? She wrote this book, um, The Feminine Mystique. Um, and this is just, it's a book about the plight of women in the 1960s and just discusses feminism and what's going on with women at the time. Um, do I have a picture of, of her in this slideshow? I don't know. All right, anyway, uh, yes. So here, this is Betty Friedan. This is her book, The Feminine Mystique. Uh, the first chapter is titled The Problem That Has No Name, and it discusses the concept of essentially that in our patriarchal society, um, you you know, have who knows how many women who um, could have done something other than, than what they're doing, but have like basically um, uh, trapped themselves in a more limited role. And so if you read the book, she doesn't say there's anything wrong with being a mother or a stay-at-home mom or anything like that. Uh, she just argues that um, women should have the choice. Women should be able to pursue something else and not feel like they're being bad mothers or bad wives by doing so. Um, here's another photo. Uh, this is, uh, so on the, on the far left is founder and president of the National Organization for Women, Betty Naomi Goldstein Friedan. I mentioned the National Organization of Women for Women. This was a is a women's rights organization um, created by Friedan that still to this day uh, just kind of fights for women's rights. Um, formed in 1966 by Friedan. And I believe that's the next item on the study guide, right? Um, but that's basically it. need to know what it stands for and that it was the Women's Rights Organization started by Friedan. All right, so the next item on the study guide is the Mattachine Society. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, so the Mattachine Society was a, is 
is, was, um, a gay rights group. Um, started, gosh, I mean, when were they started? They're pretty old. Um, they were started in 1950. I just looked it up. Um, they were, uh, yeah, so um, started by communist and labor activist Harry Hay um, with a collection of his uh, male friends in Los Angeles uh, to protect and improve uh, the rights of gay men. And so, anyway, uh, the name comes uh, from a uh, French medieval renaissance group that he was interested in, I guess. I don't know. But anyway. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. They, they uh, most of the Medellin uh, founders were communist, which definitely made things harder for them. But they just kind of sought to uh, normalize homosexuality in the United States and to improve gay rights. Uh, I think really a big focus was just decriminalizing um, homosexual behavior. Um, they, by the 1960s, they had really kind of fallen apart and were just kind of a loose group of unconnected, like local Mattachine groups here and there. Um, however, um, they were, uh, you know, definitely um, strengthened by the next item uh, on the study guide, which is the Stonewall Riots. Um, so the Stonewall Riots, also known as the Stonewall Uprising or Stonewall Rebellion, uh, this was a series of protests held in New York City um, in uh, uh, June of 1969. I guess it started in June. It went into July because it started like June 28th and went to like July 3rd. Um, but essentially the, the genesis of this, um, the Stonewall Inn was a famous uh, gay club in Greenwich Village in New York City. Um, and... Uh, the police in New York City, among other places, like to sometimes just go to local gay clubs and, you know, beat up the gay people because, you know, they were prejudiced against them. But I mean, because also the people there um, are living underground, usually, right? They're not open with their sexuality because society doesn't really allow for that at this time. And so they're not going to report it. Plus, who are they going to report it to? Who do you go to when the police come and beat you up, right? So, um, but then this just on June 28th, 1969, the police showed up at the Stonewall Inn to start beating up gay people and the gays fought back. And what, you know, started as police attacking them at this bar became, you know, five, six days of battles in the streets of gays and police fighting each other in the streets. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a very big event. And on the one-year anniversary of it, June 28, 1970, um, the very first gay pride parades were held in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. And they weren't really parades. They were just protest marches. But this is where the gay pride parade thing comes from. This is why pride is usually, I believe, is celebrated in June and July. Um, I guess, I don't know. Depends. But anyway. And then... I want to say it's like 2020 that it was made. Uh, um, no, it's 2000. Uh, is it 2000 that it was? Be, it became a uh, Stonewall Inn became a national monument. No, it's 2016. Yes, um, 2016. President Obama uh, named the Stonewall Inn. A national monument and it's the first so far I don't know if it's the only but so far the first uh, national monument dedicated to the LGBT uh, rights movement okay so moving off of that the next item on the study guide um, is the subject of this week's or was it last week's last week's yeah um, last week's uh, voice of freedom assignment um, which is uh, Cesar Chavez so uh, Cesar, uh, Cesar Chavez was a civil rights worker who um, uh, began uh, the United Farm Workers, uh, the first union for uh, migrant farm workers. So uh, Chavez was the son of migrant farm workers, um, a big fan of Martin Luther King, 
And he and another uh, Hispanic rights activist who I actually got to meet uh, when I was in grad school, Dolores Huerta, um, started the UFW. Um, they held uh, nonviolent protest marches, um, you know, fat hunger strikes, and a national boycott of California grapes that lasted like, gosh, I don't even know how many years um, to get uh, the UFW to be recognized as a union. Um, and, you know, to fight the horrible, horribly low wages and horrible working conditions of migrant farm workers. Um, and in 1970, the, mag, the, the major growers actually agreed to contracts with the UFW. Major, major win. Um, so, yeah, I met Dolores Huerta. I think I have a, a picture of her on my, on my wall back there next to Cesar Chavez's or near it. Um, but, uh, yeah, Dolores Huerta was a really cool lady. Uh, she was a elementary school teacher um, in California who, you know, um, was were with these, these kids. And um, she said, you know, she just got tired of trying to teach kids who were starving, basically. And so she began to devote her life to activism for those migrant farm workers. Then she met up with Cesar Chavez, and the two of them worked together to form the, the UFW. So she was a really cool lady. Um, she told stories about, like, thugs from the company coming in beating her and Cesar Chavez up like, in her home, like breaking down the door and beating them up. She had, she showed us like scars on her head where she had been beaten by the, by the, the, the people working for the company, but they persisted and they were successful. Um, the next item on here is the Young Lords movement. Um, so the Young Lords was a um, organization formed in New York City based on the Black Panthers but for um, uh, the city's Puerto Rican and Latino and other Latino uh, uh, people. Um, they say street demonstrations to protest high unemployment among the city's um, Latino uh, people. They uh, dumped garbage um, in the streets of New York City to draw attention to the fact that uh, the city refused to collect trash in poor neighborhoods. Here's the Young Lords. Uh, they wore brown berets, similar to the black berets worn by the Black Panthers. So that's an example there. Um, it's kind of like a brown pride thing. Chicano Park in San Diego's Barrio Logan neighborhood is a museum in the unlikeliest of places, underneath a web of highway overpasses. During the 1970s, a group of artists looked at the park's concrete pylons, and instead of an eyesore, they saw a canvas. These same artists are back in the park today, restoring 18 of the 72 historic murals. It is important because if we don't, they're gonna disappear for one day. These were painted 30, 40 years ago, and the paints that we use then are not as uh, strong and much more uh, everlasting, and they're better made today. At the time, artists really didn't have money to, to buy paint, so their resources were the resources from car dealerships, thrown out discarded paints. We all love to use as artists because we don't know what we're gonna get, but they used anything they can get their hands up. These artists were documenting the political and social struggles of their community. They were also celebrating a rich history and culture of Mexican Americans. The Chicano mural movement is another expression of Latino pride in the 1960s. Um, and it isn't on your study guide, but it is something that I think is really neat. And I, it's actually in the TEKS, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills for the STAR test. The next item on the study guide is the American Indian Movement. So the American Indian Movement, um, also known as Red Power, uh, begins in the 1960s um, primarily. Um, it's founded in, well, the official group, the American Indian Movement, or AIM, was founded in 1968. Uh, the American Indian Movement, founded in 1968, staged various protests, sometimes armed. Uh, uh, a similar group, Indians of All Tribes, which was definitely part of that movement, um, in 1969, uh, reoccupied, as they, as they saw it, uh, Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay, claiming it had been illegally seized from the original inhabitants, which is, I mean, true, absolutely true. Uh, you can see here they, they you know, um, painted over the sign where it says United States property, and, you know, now it says United, United Indian welcome, Indians welcome, United Indian property, um, allowed ashore without a pass, Indian land, um, and kind of like an eagle or hawk 
drawing there. Um, and so they occupied Alcatraz Island for, gosh, like over a year, like into 1971. Um, and this was kind of the beginning of what we call the Red Power Movement. Uh, interestingly, by the way, Alcatraz, um, historically, right, had been made into a prison, a federal prison. It's where people like Al Capone had been taken. Um, but it had been shut down, gosh, I think in the 50s, and was just left vacant um, and fecund. Um, after this, sometime shortly after this, it was turned into a national park. And today, if you go to San Francisco, you can visit and they've restored the prison and give tours and stuff and they lock you in the cells and all that. But, um, you know, maybe they should have given it back to the Indians, right? Interesting. Um, oh, I don't have any more pictures for them. Um, they also, uh, the book doesn't talk about this, but it was during this time... I think it may have been 1970s that they, uh, the Indians of all tribes, or maybe AIM, uh, occupied Wounded Knee as well, where the Wounded Knee Massacre had taken place. All right, but the next item on the study guide is Silent Spring. So Silent Spring um, is a actually very controversial book. Um, so this book was a, uh, written by Rachel Carson, who's a marine biologist. Um, so she wrote this book in 1962, to bring to light the effects of DDT, the um, insecticide, um, and show how it was running off into our water, you know, into our fresh water and oceans and killing birds and animals and also making people sick in some cases. Chemical and pesticide companies launched, launched a campaign to discredit her, um, including, you know, calling her a communist. Even Time Magazine referred to her with the, uh, the term, they called her hysterical, which is a, you know, we use hysterical now to mean like funny, right? But hysterical originated as a um, kind of a, a, it's a sexist word against women going back to uh, the kind of 19th century idea that women who rebelled against society were suffering from a mental disorder called hysteria. Um, they also called her emotional another word often used to discredit women. Uh, now, what I will say about it, what's controversial about it, is that some of her data has been called into question, not for being um, purposely wrong, but for being kind of misunderstood. And the other big thing is, is that it, call, it caused a lot of governments, such as the U.S. government and the EU, to ban or limit the use of DDT, which then subsequently has led to... Um, those chemicals being harder to acquire in the third world. And some of those third world countries are country or some developing, let's say developing countries are countries that um, malaria is a big problem in and the lack of DDT has made it harder to fight malaria. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, there is kind of a push and pull on those things. All right. But uh, the next item on the study, on our study guide here is uh, Ralph Nader. I like Ralph Nader. He's a cool guy. Uh, so Ralph Nader was a, um, I'm trying to think of what his original job had been. Um, he was a lawyer. That's right. He was a lawyer. Um, and he wrote a book in 1965 called Unsafe at Any Speed um, about the Chevy Corvair. Um, and he talked about, basically, um, he showed how, in, if you read the book, essentially what he shows is that um, uh, the Chevy Corvair was uh, prone to rollovers um, and that General Motors had essentially determined that, yeah, it's prone to rollovers and those rollovers are often fatal, but the amount of money it would cost us to fix the problem is less than the amount of money we spend by settling on wrongful death and wrongful injury lawsuits every year. So it's financially better for us to just continue to promote the Corvair in spite of its dangerous nature. Um, now, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, um, I'm sorry. So anyway, after this book was written, um, General Motors hired uh, private investigators to discredit him. They failed to do so. Um, Nader counter uh, sued them for defamation and they ended up settling 
uh, giving him millions and millions of dollars. He then kept none of the money, but instead used it to start a uh, consumer advocacy group and to investigate other dangerous products. Um, and uh, so Nader is um, definitely um, partially responsible for the introduction of seatbelts as being mandatory. Um, he will later be uh, very um, important in getting a anti-lock brake systems standard in cars, as well as airbags. Uh, and uh, I believe he, he was involved in other things, but he later ran for president. Uh, most kind of infamously, he ran for president under the Green Party in the 2000 presidential election. And um, it's pretty certain that most of the people who voted for him would have voted for the Democrat candidate Al Gore instead if he had not run. And Al Gore lost Florida by less than 3,000 votes. And Nader got something like 85,000 votes. And if Gore had won Florida, then he would have won the election and become president instead of George W. Bush. So it's a whole thing. Um, that's not important. That's just interesting. Um, anyway. Uh, but And then I put down here, there is a, a, a an editorial argue, uh, a article by Bloomberg in 2016 that says, hey, the Corvair is actually not that dangerous. You should check it out. But that's... Uh, it says the NHTSA cleared it of all accusations seven years after the publication of the book. Um, that's that's questionable, but it is there. All right. Um, the next item on our study guide is Red Monday. Um, Red Monday is uh, was the a, a term coined by conservatives to describe June seventeenth, nineteen fifty seven, a Monday, um, when. Uh, the Supreme Court kind of uh, um, cleared house and overturned several convictions of uh, people who had, uh, of communist or accused communist who had been um, uh, for various things. People who had advocated the overthrow of the government, people who had refused to speak to UAC, including the Hollywood 10. Um, people who had refused to disclose their political beliefs to state officials, various things. Uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren famously said that it's not the job of the federal government. Um, or he said, the federal government can prosecute illegal actions, but it cannot prosecute unorthodoxy or dissent. Something like that. That's not the exact quote, I don't think. But anyway. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's Red Monday. And that is 1957, but this is going to continue into the 60s because Earl Warren's not going to retire until 1969. Um, and so uh, what we see over the course of the 1960s is a Supreme Court that becomes more and more in favor of free speech and more and more against cracking down on dissent. And a, a Supreme Court that's more in favor of expanding civil rights rather than maybe uh, contracting them. And so we're going to look at a few different cases very briefly because, you know, we're running low on time here. Um, so first up, we have NAACP versus Alabama. Uh, your book does not really say much about this case. Um, the background of this case is basically um, the state of Alabama had tried to make it. This is 1958, so we're still not quite in the 60s. Uh, the Supreme Court had, I'm sorry, the state of Alabama had tried to ban the NAACP from operating in the state. Um, and in the legal back and forth over this in Alabama, the uh, state uh, uh, had tried to um, uh, subpoena various like membership, you know, various records, including like a list of members and all that. And eventually this went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the NAACP on all counts. What's really important is they essentially said the freedom to associate with an organization is, um, if that organization, sorry, let me read that, let me restate this. The freedom to associate with organizations dedicated to the advancement of beliefs and ideas is an inseparable part of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. In other words, right, your ability to belong to an organization that is focused on belief or ideas 
right? So not like a criminal group or something, um, is absolute is protected by the Fourteenth Amendment. In other words, so you cannot go after someone for being, say, a member of the Communist Party. That would be an example, or in this case, a member of the NAACP. All right, so that's NAACP versus Alabama. Like I said, your book doesn't really give you a lot of information on it, besides the just gist. But there you are. All right, our next case is Loving versus Virginia. Um, I feel like I have these out of order. Yeah, these slides are out of order. There we go. Uh, so Richard and Mildred Loving, Richard and Mildred Loving, a white man, black woman, married, um, moved to Virginia. They were then um, discriminated against there. Uh, in fact, uh, Richard Loving was arrested. Police, you know, like pulled him out of his home in the middle of the night and arrested them for miscegenation, which was the law banning interracial marriage. At the time of this case, interracial marriage between whites and blacks was illegal in 16 states. Yes, including Texas. And in 1967, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, interracial marriage laws were a violation of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me reread this because I had some of the facts wrong. Richard and Mildred Loving um, got married in Washington, D.C. So they were from... Virginia. They went to D.C. and got married and then returned to their home state. Two weeks after they returned, the local sheriff entered their home in the middle of the night while they were asleep. So they didn't knock. This is a no-knock situation. Um, arrested both of them. They were sentenced to five years in prison, but the judge told them they could avoid prison time by leaving the state. So they moved to Washington State to avoid prison, but five years later, wishing to return to Virginia, they sued in federal court and the Supreme Court ruled in their favor. So that's a big Supreme Court case ending interracial marriage laws and was the basis for, or at least partially the basis for the ruling in 2015, Obergefell versus Hodges that um, ended anti-gay marriage laws throughout the country. All right, the next item on our study guide is Griswold versus Connecticut, which was the, uh, the one I had, yeah, my slides are out of order here. All right, Griswold versus Connecticut is, uh, what, 19... I just realized I've got I've got these all out of whack, the dates on the study guide. I've got Loving versus Virginia listed as 1960... as 1973, but it's... I see what I did. I think I mixed up Griswold and... No, I'm still wrong. I don't know. Um, I want to clarify. Loving versus Virginia, the date should not be 1973. It is 1967. All right. Now, back to where we were at. Griswold versus Connecticut is, gosh, uh, 1965. Uh, And this overturned a state law prohibiting the use of contraceptives. And what's really important about the, the, you know, so first of all, we talked about this way back in Chapter 18 and... Maybe, yeah, 18, right? I think chapter 18, when we talked about um, Margaret Sanger and the right to birth control, right? And I talked about how in most states it was illegal for a woman to purchase birth control without the consent of her husband, if at all, right? Um, and it had to be, you know, a doctor's prescription with consent of the husband, etc. cetera. Um, and anyway, so, you know, 1965, uh, Justice Douglas, William O. Douglas, um, the guy to the right of Warren right there, um, in the picture, uh, he uh, issued the he wrote the majority opinion, and he said, "The right to be let alone, and the uh, the right to be left alone, or let alone, let alone, is the beginning of all freedom." Um, and so, um, essentially, he's he's saying that we have sort of a a right of uh, what what he called a zone of privacy within marriage. Um, and he, he said um, that it should be inferred from what we call the penumbras of the Bill of Rights. So that's a lot of words, a lot of big words. Penumbra means shadow. Um, and the shadow of the Bill of Rights, so what he means by we should infer from the shadow of the Bill of Rights is, yeah, the right to privacy is not literally in the Bill of Rights, but we should infer that the Bill of Rights is implying a right to privacy. Um, and the reasoning behind this, I think, mostly comes from the Fourth Amendment, 
protection from the government um, uh, uh, unlawfully searching or seizing your person, uh, property, or um, effects, right? And so the idea is if the government can't search your body without due cause, without due, you know, without uh, just cause, then how can they tell you what to do with your body, such as whether or not you use birth control, um, or that that's the reasoning. I'm not I'm not saying one way or the other, but that's I think that's where it comes from. Uh, this was definitely um, we'll come back to Grizzle versus Connecticut in a minute because we need to we're going to move on to the next case. Roe v. Wade. So 1973, Roe v. Wade. You've heard about Roe v. Wade. Um, Roe v. Wade was a Supreme Court decision in 1973 that um, limited, did not end completely, but limited the ability of state of uh, the state to ban abortion. It still allowed states to restrict abortion in various ways, but it did not allow them to outright ban it. And it based, this is important because Roe v. Wade was based partially on Griswold versus Connecticut, right? It's a, it is a kind of a logical extension. If you agree with Griswold versus Connecticut and that idea of the zone of privacy inferred from the Bill of Rights, then it's a kind of a natural extension to then extend that to abortion. Uh, is the, uh, that's the argument, right? Um, but of course, you know, as we know, in 2021, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. And when they did so, they said that that right, you know, the right of privacy that it's based on is not implied, right? Um, which then calls into question Griswold versus Connecticut. Um, so, you know, so far that hasn't come up, but we'll see. We'll see where all that goes, right? We're still kind of in a, a transitional period with that stuff um, in terms of, of all that. But anyway, um, I want to move on. The, te- the next item on the study guide is the Tet Offensive, which is covered in tomorrow's Vietnam lecture. The next thing after that is Martin Luther King's Poor People's March and um, Assassination. And so I'm going to play a little video for you here. On April 4th, 1968, Dr. King stepped out onto the balcony of his motel room in Memphis, where he had been meeting with Ralph Abernathy, Jesse Jackson, and others. From across the way, a single shot was fired. Martin Luther King fell dead, murdered at the age of 39. James Earl Ray was convicted of the murder of Martin Luther King. King was a man with extraordinary gifts, a dreamer with a vision of equality he shared so generously for the good of humanity, a hero of magnificent courage, eloquence, and inspiration, a father of four young children, a leader with a lifetime of yet untapped potential. We will be the participants in a great building process that will make America a new nation. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. This is our challenge. This is the way we must grapple with this dilemma. We will be a great people. Let us have faith in the future. I know it's dark. And I know all of us begin to ask, how long will we have to live with this system? I know all of us are asking, How long will prejudice blind the visions of men? Darken their understanding and drive bright-eyed wisdom from her sacred throne. When will wounded justice, lying prostrate on the streets of our city, be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men? Yes, when will the radiant star of hope be plunged against the nocturnal bosom of this lonely night? 200,000 Americans, black and white, walked slowly through the sun-baked streets of Atlanta following the mule-drawn sharecropper's farm wagon that carried his casket. In the aftermath of King's death, riots broke out in over 100 cities. Tens of thousands were arrested. All right. So, yeah. um, So the gist here, uh, King was planning a poor people's march on Washington, D.C., uh, to demand um, 
and increased anti-poverty efforts, not just for the black community, but for poor the poor community in general. He had also uh, notably begun uh, speaking out against the Vietnam War. He had written, uh, I think, I know a speech. Yeah, he had given a famous speech uh, called Why I'm Opposed to the Vietnam War. Um, and, and in fact, he gave that on April 3rd, uh, 1968. And then on April 4th, 1968, he was, uh, he was killed by, allegedly by, a white assassin named James Earl Ray. Um, this led to the greatest outbreak of urban violence in the nation's history in ghettos across the country. Washington, D.C. had to be occupied by soldiers. Um, and uh, Congress passed the 1968 uh, Civil Rights Act, also known as the um, Open Housing Act, which prohibited discrimination in the sale uh, and rental of homes and apartments, though with weak enforcement. But they did that kind of in, in his kind of honor. Uh, shortly after his assassination in June, Robert Kennedy, uh, who was um, the considered the Democratic Party frontrunner for the 1968 presidential election, uh, was assassinated, um, and he was uh, you know probably the biggest champion of civil rights in the country at the time, um, other than King uh, and Johnson and, and Johnson. So that was kind of a big, or at least among white politicians, he was the biggest champion of civil rights. Um, alongside Lyndon Johnson. And so anyway, that leads us to the final uh, item on the study guide, and that is Richard Nixon's silent majority. So when Nixon ran for president in 1968 as the Republican candidate, he said that he was representing a silent majority of Americans. So what is this? I'm going to read just from your book here. It says, um, in the United States, instead of radical change, the year's events, 1968's events, opened the doors for a conservative reaction. Turmoil in the streets produced a demand for public order. Black militancy produced white backlash, which played an increasing role in politics. The fact that the unelected Supreme Court was inventing and protecting rights, uh, in some people's view, fed the argument that faraway bureaucrats rode roughshod over local traditions. In August, Richard Nixon capped a remarkable political comeback by winning the Republican nomination. He campaigned as a champion of the silent majority, ordinary Americans who believed that change had gone too far, and called for a renewed commitment to law and order. So you can see um, in the election, the Democrat Hubert Humphrey won a handful of traditional northern liberal Democrat states. Uh, the you know pro-segregation candidate George Wallace, the segregationist governor of Alabama, won um, most of the South, and Nixon won the rest of the country, including a good chunk of the South as well. So he was successful. Um, and this is really, by the way, shows you the effect of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. You'll note that you know Northern liberal Democrat Hubert Humphrey won Texas. That is the only Southern state he wins. And that's, I think... That's the, we, we're see, we've seen the beginning of the end uh, for the Democratic Party of Texas for the foreseeable future. And anyway, that's it. That's, that is cha that's it. That's chapter 25. So thank you guys for joining me and uh, hope to see you in person again soon. Bye.